so my presentation is about provably secure logic locking. Uh, logic locking is a technique to prevent reverse engineering of integrated circuits. Uh, I'll start by motivating the need for solutions uh, like logic locking, followed by a description of the prior art. Uh, then I'll describe our proposed approach, which is known as stripped functionality logic locking, SFLL. Uh, it has two versions, SFLL HD and SFLL Flex. And we have a first uh, a, a, a prototype of silicon implementation of this chip, uh, which we'll present and followed by the conclusion. Uh, as already highlighted in the previous presentation, uh, IC supply chain is uh, globalized now. Uh, it's because the companies uh, cannot own fab, uh, fabs or foundries on their own. It's very expensive. It's uh, in, uh, around the order of $5 billion. So what they do is actually they outsource design and mainly fabrication or even test or assembly of the chips to companies located all across the globe, which means that your valuable design IP is being handled by potentially malicious entities and which can create, uh, which can compromise the security uh, in the form of many threats, for example, counterfeiting, which, uh, which refers to re-rebuild or recycled IPs. Uh, there is also the threat of IP piracy. Uh, one manifestation of it is in the form of overbuilding uh, at untrusted foundry, which can sell those extra ICs in the market at lower prices. Uh, as already mentioned in the previous presentation, we also have the threat of backdoors or hardware trojans. Uh, which can, uh, which can uh, cause disruption of service at some stage. And a major enabler of all these attacks is actually reverse engineering. And reverse engineering allows you to clone your circuit, create copies of it. So what you do is that you take a package IC and you depackage it by, for example, exposing it to some chemicals like acids. Then you delayer it one layer at a time and you put it under a microscope, a scanning electron microscope and take the images. You stitch these images together using a software or maybe manually, and you get the schematic. This example is from a company called Texplained, and they reverse engineer a smart card in a time of less than three weeks. There's another company called Chipworks, which provides reverse engineering as a service. And while uh, reverse engineering has a good uh, uses, it could also be used by attackers to uh, reverse engineer the circuits and for other malicious purposes. So we need solutions like logic locking uh, or split manufacturing, et cetera, to prevent against uh, these uh, uh, reverse engineering attacks. So uh, as I already mentioned, that in the traditional IC design flow, you start with the design specifications and you design your chip layout or GDS2 files, which when sent to the, an offshore fab are actually prone to piracy and also they can be tempered with. But with logic locking in place, your chip will have embedded hardware locks inside it, which will shield it from privacy and also make it a little bit harder to insert hardware trojans in the chip. And if you look at a logic lock circuit, it will look like the following, that it's a function of the primary inputs as well as the key inputs, right? The output is depending upon both key and primary inputs. And for example, in this example, I have an original circuit with three inputs and a locked circuit, uh, which is locked using three XOR or XNOR key gates. There, these key gates should also be multiplexers the important thing is one of the inputs is controlled by a tamper-proof memory. In this example, the correct key is 110, uh, and when I apply this correct key to the circuit, I'll get the correct output. Okay. But if I apply an incorrect key to the circuit, you will get an incorrect output. So this is an important property of logic locking. And because only the designer knows the secret key, so uh, he, only he can make the chip functional, for any other uh, per, uh, entity which has the lock net least will not be able to get the correct output without the knowledge of the key. That's why reverse engineering based piracy and overbuilding attacks are thwarted. Uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, reverse engineering, uh, that uh, logic locking protects your design, right? Your circuit. Uh, it does not protect the application or the user data. Uh, so now I'll describe the prior art in this area in terms of a timeline of attacks and defenses, uh, starting with random logic locking, which is the first logic locking technique. This was followed by FLL and SLL, uh, which are variants uh, of traditional logic locking techniques. But all of these techniques actually are vulnerable to a class of attacks known as algorithmic attacks, uh, namely sensitization attack and SAT attack. SAT attack is the most powerful attack on logic locking. It actually broke all the existing techniques then. So then the focus of the research has been on SAT attack resilient logic locking techniques, namely SAR lock, anti-SAT, and TT lock. But now, recently, we have seen emergence of new class of threats, namely removal or structural attacks. Uh, so what these attacks do is actually they find the security vulnerabilities in the hardware and remove the protection logic to get the original netlist. 
And there is another class of emerging attack, which is known as approximate attacks, which do not recover the exact netlist. They actually recover an approximate netlist, which has a small error rate as when you compare the output to the original circuit. So from this, we get the idea that there is a lot of attacks, and we need a secure solution which thwarts these attacks. And I hope I'll try to convince you that uh, uh, SFLL, our proposed solution, actually thwarts all these attacks. So in the, later, in the rest of my presentation, I'll start with the most powerful SAT attack, and then I'll describe the first solution known as SARLOCK, and I will slowly morph it into our solution known as SFLL. Uh, moving to the SAT attack, let's describe the threat model. The attacker has two pieces of information. He has a lock netlist and a functional IC. The lock netlist uh, can be obtained from reverse engineering, and functional IC can be brought from the market. And we have the key search space, and the objective of the attacker is to find the correct key highlighted in green. What he does is he takes his analog netlist and analyzes it to compute the attack patterns. These attack patterns are then applied to a functional IC, and the output of the IC, which is the correct output, is recorded and fed back to the analysis tool so that you can uh, uh, remove or eliminate some of the incorrect keys from the search space. Then this process is repeated further, incorrect keys are eliminated until you are left with only the correct key. And uh, this uh, analysis tool I mentioned is known as Boolean Satisfiability or SAT Solver. And these patterns it computes are known as distinguishing input patterns because they divide the keys into two classes, correct and incorrect. Now, uh, this is an example of a SAT attack where it applies the DIP1 in the first iteration for which only the key K4 is giving you incorrect output. So this is classified as incorrect key and remove them from the search space. In the next iteration, we remove two more keys, and when we apply the input pattern three, we uh, eliminate all the incorrect keys in one iteration, and the attack is successful, retrieving the correct key, K6. Uh, this example shows you that attack success depends how many keys will be eliminated at one DIP, right? And the number of DIPs required for the attack will be dictated by the distinguishing ability of the DIPs. So if we look at a, uh, the worst case scenario for the attack, it means that in one iteration or, in, or for one DIP, only one key is eliminated. So, uh, so if you see in each row, there is exactly one red entry. So in this case, the number of required DIPs will be exponential in the key size that is 2 to the power k. But if you note that most of this table is, has green entries, right? Which means that most of the time, the circuit will work correctly. So we are kind of achieving the SAT resilience at the expense of uh, output, what we call percentage of incorrect outputs or output corruption. Uh, so the first uh, solution uh, to the SAT attack is known as SORLOCK. What it simply does, it takes the original circuits and add a comparator with it. And now this flip signal, which is the output of comparator, is one whenever key is equal to the input value. That is, all the incorrect entries are in the diagonal. And which means uh, now to restore the output for the correct key, which is K6 in, uh, throughout my presentation, we use a mask signal, which makes the flip is equal to zero for the correct key value, retrieving the correct output. And we see if we launch SAT attack on this example, we'll need exactly seven input patterns. And in the general case, we'll need two to the power k input pattern, which is the maximum SAT attack resilience. But this technique has problems. It is prone to removal attacks or structural attacks, which work by detaching the protection logic, which is highlighted here in blue. So if you detach this protection logic, you are left with the original circuit, which is the objective of the attacker. Uh, another problem is that it is also prone to the approximate attacks, right? So for example, if I take any key here, for example, I took randomly K3, and I see that there is only one input pattern, which is three in this case, which will give you the incorrect output. All the other input patterns are giving you the correct output, which is shown in green. So the error rate is very small. It's one over two to the power K. So only one input pattern is correct. So this is another problem with the SAR lock. So another technique which mitigates some of these problems is known as TT lock. What it does is implements a modified circuit on chip, right? When I say modification, it means that I take an example original circuit, and I change one or two gates in the circuit to create a modified or functionality stripped circuit because we took away some of the functionality from it. And now, if I apply a pattern, for example, 1106, which is also my key throughout this presentation, we see that uh, the output for this pattern is correct for the original circuit, whereas it's incorrect for the functionality stripped circuit. Now, if we launch uh, and now we see that uh, in the table, we have one row of incorrect entries because YFS is independent of the key value. And now let's launch removal attack on this. What we'll get is a modified circuit, or as I also called a functionality strip circuit, which varies from the original circuit for exactly one protected pattern. 
I call it protected pattern because it is quantifying your protection against the removal attack. When we talk about approximate attack, we again have a very small error, but there are not two incorrect entries in each column now. And when we talk about set attack resilience, so we see that because of this row of protected pattern, if the attacker applies this pattern, he will succeed immediately, right? The attack will terminate right away, retrieving the correct key, K6. Uh, and we, when we take the probability of hitting this pattern uniformly, we see that uh, the number of required DIPs on average is still exponential, and we call it that it is K resilient against the SAT attack. So we see that TTLock is K resilient against SAT attack, but it offers very minimal protection against removal and approximate attacks. That brings me to our proposed approach known as SFLL, Strip Functionality Logic Locking, which mitigates these uh, issues. So it is based on the concept of strip and restore. That is, you implement the functionality strip circuit on chip. This circuit is different from your original circuit for a very large and controllable number of input patterns. And we show that this technique is secure against all the known attacks on logic locking. We offer a quantifiable protection against different attacks. Moreover, we offer trade-offs between resilience to different attacks. It has two versions. The first version is SFLL HD, where HD denotes the Hamming distance, so it's based on a Hamming distance unit. And SFLL Flex denotes some flexibility for the designer. So now I'll describe SFLL HD. So in this technique, let's start with the functionality strip circuit. But no, it's not modified for one pattern. It's modified for multiple patterns. And in this particular example, I, again, I have chosen the key 6110 and I take those input pattern for which the Hamming distance is one from six, right? So two, four, and seven. And th I'm, then to restore the output for the correct key, what I do is I take a Hamming distance unit, which computes the Hamming distance of input and key, and it should be equal to a value h. And when we integrate them together, we see that the correct output is indeed restored for the key k6. And also we have higher output corruption here. There are more direct entries in the table. And this H value actually allows us to control how many protected patterns we want. The relation with increasing value of H is binomial. So let's launch the removal attack on this, right? When we launch the removal attack, we'll retrieve the functionality strip circuit, which varies, uh, which has K choose H protected patterns, right? And when we talk about SAT attack, because there is a higher number of protected patterns, the SAT attack resilience will be decreased, but by only a logarithmic factor, so it will be K minus log two of K choose H. And, and again, when we consider the approximate attacks, for each column here, we expect k to the choose h uh, incorrect entries. So this increases the uh, error rate or resilience against the approximate attacks. Uh, this brings me to my experimental setup for this first technique. We launched it on ISCAS 89 and ITC 99 uh, benchmark circuits, so the B18 circuit having more than 1,000k gate, gates. Uh, this was the, uh, the experiments were performed on an Intel processor with 28 cores. Uh, in hardware, we always compute our area overhead, uh, the power consumption of the chip, and also the delay overhead, which also tells you the operating frequency decrease. So uh, we use Synapsys design tool and Global Foundry 65 nanometer library for that. And for experimental validation, we used SAT, uh, AppSAT, and double deep attacks. So let's talk about the SAT attack first. And we see as we increase the key size from 11 towards 14, the attack resilience is linear with respect to the key size K which means that number of DIPs will be exponential or the attack time will also be exponential with respect to the key size. But when we increase the value of H, we increase the number of protected patterns, uh, there is a log binomial decrease in the attack resilience. Uh, then I'll discuss the approximate attacks, namely AppSat. Uh, what AppSat does is it uh, tries to retrieve approximate netlist with a low error rate. So when H is small, my error rate is small, this attack is indeed successful and retrieves the approximate net list. But when the H value is larger, it cannot retrieve the correct approximate net list. So what it does is it behaves more or less same like the SAT attack because it is a derivative of the SAT attack. We have another derivative of the SAT attack known as double dip, which computes two DIPs, that is a DIPs which eliminate at least two keys per iteration. So against this attack also fails uh, and behaves more or less like a SAT attack, only for the value of H is equal to zero, where there are no TH DAPs, it succeeds in the first iteration. Uh, this brings me to the security trade-offs, right? I mentioned that we can trade off resilience against removal attack in terms of number of protected patterns, and for the SAT attack in terms of the security level S, we see that in the corner regions, where uh, H is either 
close to zero or close to the value of k, we have highest static attack resilience. And in the middle region where h is close to k over two, we have the maximal resilience against the removal attack. I'll also mention another recent attack published at uh, chess uh, conference, which is known as bypass attack. So what this attack does is it takes approximate netlist and couples it with the bypass circuit to get the exact netlist. And during this process, it takes two key values, two random key values, and find all the DIPs for that. That is the pattern which lead to differing output, right? In this particular example, those patterns are two and three. And then it creates a bypass circuit to fix wherever there is an error uh, in the results. And we see that when we launch this attack on SFLL HD or SFLL in general, it will not succeed. Why? Because we have these protected patterns here, which are not DIPs. For, they are giving the same output for these two key values, and they will not be included in the computation. So the circuit you will retrieve is actually exactly the same that you will retrieve with the removal attack. And in terms of our implementation overhead, for the largest five circuit, it is 10%, 6%, and minus 5%. This minus 5 actually in indicates a savings in the uh, delay. And I'll also like to mention the execution time of our approach, which is actually dominated by this functionality strip or recency operation. But even for the largest circuit, which is B18, it is in the order of a few minutes. Uh, now I'll describe the second technique, which is SFL flex. So the problem with SFL LHD is that the designer can only choose one secret key, and that will decide all the patterns to be protected. What if he wants to uh, uh, protect the patterns on his own, right? What if he wants to specify the pat protected patterns? And one way to specify these patterns is in the form of cubes, right? Set of patterns, which can be represented compactly. For example, this cube 011XX can represent actually four patterns, right? So let's say the designer wants to specify four arbitrary patterns. So we can take these patterns and store them compactly in the lookup table. And then we can restore the circuit for these patterns. Uh, this particular uh, uh, technique is very helpful in applications where we have consecutive addresses. For example, in case of IP addresses where you want to protect for a particular range of IP addresses or for memory addresses, right? And this also allows us two optimization opportunities. The first is that we can compactly represent the cubes to reduce the lookup table size. And we can also do a security aware synthesis where we can actually decide for the designer which parts of the circuit he wants to protect in a cost effective manner. And for that, we can use a simulated annealing approach, which is a very simple optimization strategy uh, to reduce both the cost of the functionality strip circuit as well as the size of the lookup table, which is specified in terms of C and K, where C is the number of cubes and k is the number of k bits in each cube. As I mentioned, there are two steps, uh, two stages for SFLL flex algorithm. The first is to compact the cubes, and the second is a security-aware logic synthesis based on simulated annealing, followed by logic on optimization. And as, as you see in this example, uh, we have the original circuit uh, with five cubes specified by the designer, and we can reduce them to two cubes only. Uh, this reduces the size of the lookup table significantly. Moreover, as you see, the functionality strip circuit has one less gate than the original circuit, so which will result in area savings as well as delay savings. Finally, the log circuit is combined by uh, uh, combining FSE with the lookup table. I like to mention, although the detailed proofs are in the paper, that we are, uh, this technique is also secure against the SAT attack as well as the removal attack against the SAT attack. Uh, the resilience is specified as k minus log 2 of c, where c is the number of uh, cubes. And against the removal attacks, we have c protected cubes, or c into 2 to the power n minus k uh, protected patterns. Uh, once again, in terms of experimental validation for the SAT attack, we see that uh, the same linear uh, relation with respect to the key size is there, but with each increasing cube, the relation is logarithmic, decrease in the SAT attack resilience. And uh, uh, before mentioning the implementation overhead, I'll also like to mention the cube compression ratio achieved by our technique. So it can be of the order even uh, 800 times, uh, so re uh, significantly reducing the size of the lookup table. And in terms of the area power and delay overhead for the largest five circuit, it is 6%, 4%, and minus 1.5% for the largest uh, five benchmark circuits. And now, because we are using simulated annealing, and this approach can actually uh, try multiple initial values to explore the entire search space, so which can actually uh, lead to higher execution time, but still it's in the order of a few hours for the largest circuit, so it takes a few hours to synthesize this circuit. Uh, now I'll come to the implementation of the chip. Uh, so we implemented this technique 
uh, on a cort arm on an industry standard arm uh, cortex m0 based uh, microcontroller which we developed in house uh, this is the diagram of the die uh, under an uh, optical microscope uh, we locked it using SFLL HD of zero, and we also combined with fault analysis-based logic locking. Uh, this was fabricated through global foundries uh, using their 65 nanometer low power library. Uh, what we did was actually we both fabricated both the original circuit as well as its PC locked version. When I see PC locked, it means we locked the program counter. Okay? And as, as I will show in this example, that uh, for the locked version, that means which does not have the correct key loaded onto it, the execution will be incorrect, okay? So the PC will jump to an incorrect value, and then an interrupt routine will be called to restore it to some uh, default value, and this will continue on. So the uh, program will be halted, no correct execution is there. But when we supply the correct key to the chip, uh, we unlock it or activate it, then we can see the correct execution because the PC is incrementing regularly in counts of four, and we obtain the correct value of the output. Uh, in terms of the, our implementation overhead compared to the baseline processor, uh, the log processor overhead is minimal. It's only 1.6% for area, 5.6% for power, and only 5.4% for delay, which also tells you a slight decrease in the frequency of this processor. Uh, more importantly, uh, we have actually uh, enabled the community to perform further security analysis of our approach because we have, implement, uh, we have provided on GitHub an attack platform where we have provided them a netlist log using SFLL, and as an, uh, to, uh, in place of the functional IC, we have provided them an oracle, which is an executable. It uh, can give you the correct input and output patterns. So in summary, uh, the strip functionality logic locking is based on the concept of strip and restore. It thwarts all the known attacks on logic locking. Uh, it enables uh, resilience trade-offs for different attacks. It also allows the designer to specify which patterns he wants to protect, which is important for many applications. Uh, our implementation overhead is quite low, and we have the first uh, silicon prototype. And more importantly, we have the open source attack platform enabling the community further research in this area. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. On the microphone, please. This is very interesting work. Uh, it's clearly, your proposed approach can uh, defeat uh, most known attacks. Yes. But do you have any comments about your approach, uh, potentially for future attacks? Like, if, if I'm a attacker, I know your approach. Do you have any comments uh, sure. about uh, like attacking service for your proposed approach? Okay, I'd like to uh, mention this in terms of, uh, sorry, I'll just go back. So I mentioned the bypass attack, right? So the bypass attack was not available uh, at, at the time of submission of this paper, okay? So the, we performed the security analysis against this attack after the paper was actually accepted. We got the acceptance uh, notification. So you can see that it, this is an anticipate uh, attack and it actually uh, thwarts, uh, it, it was actually, uh, our technique actually thwarts this attack. So similarly, we offer uh, security against anticipate, most anticipated attacks because we are providing you security guarantees, right? And we have theoretical basis for those guarantees that we are secure under these assumptions, right? So this ensures the security against many anticipated attacks. <laughs>